a TED talk about power, and I'm here to tell you that power is ending. <laughs> From boardrooms to battlefields and churches to states, why being in charge isn't what it used to be. Uh, of course, I'm not as uh, naive as to believe that no one will have power. I'm just uh, going to tell you that power is going to be fundamentally changed in the 21st century. We know already, that's, uh, there's nothing new, I guess, for an audience like this in this slide. We know this. We know that power is shifting from brown to brains, from north to south, from east to west, from all corporate giants entrenched to agile startups, like the ones who are going to be created as a result of the prior talk, uh, from entrenched dictators uh, to people in streets, town squares, cyberspace, Arab Spring comes to mind, right? So we know that this is happening. But I will argue today here that there is much more, much more fundamental that is going on. Power is changing in a more fundamental and world-transforming way that most current discussions are simply missing. And my point is that power is decaying. People with power can do less with what they have than their predecessors, than before. They are more constrained, they are more limited, and uh, as I say there, in every field of endeavor, in business and religion, in all matters of war, of peace, the sciences, education, universities, philanthropy, the arts, power is no longer what it used to be. It's easier to acquire, oops, it's easier to acquire, harder to use, and it's far, far easier to lose. That's the decay of power. It's not that power is ending, the power is harder to keep. Uh, I have numbers and statistics and trends, but before that, I want to go with you through some recognizable names and individuals and see what does that tell us. What do these people have in common? Pope Benedict XVI, the current Pope. President Obama. Hu Jintao, the current leader of China. General Martin Dempsey is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He is the uh, top uh, military officer in the United States. He is on top of uh, one of the world's mightiest military establishments. Jamie Dimon, the CEO of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the banks that came on top after the crisis, is one of the world's top bankers today. What do they have in common? They're all men. Uh, what else? They all, they all have power. But what else? What else? Well, let's think about, I'm going to give you a hint by showing you the predecessors and compare and contrast the power that they have with, those of, uh, with the power of the predecessors. Pope John Paul II, Ronald Reagan. Deng Xiaoping, the architect of the Chinese reforms. This is the man that uh, in, launched massive reforms in China's economy, and thanks to him uh, and uh, the reforms that he pushed, China embarked in this massive uh, growth that created the powerhouse that it is today. Colin Powell, when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he is, of course, he coined the Powell Doctrine that says if you're going to go to war, use overwhelming force. Compare that, and he did and he that, he that, some of that was done in the Gulf, in the first Gulf War. Compare that with what has happened after that in Afghanistan, in Libya, even in Iraq. J.P. Morgan himself. <laughs> One of the most important bankers during the Great Depression, he was more important than the Secretary of the Treasury. He was the one that rallied together the bankers to try to uh, see if they could uh, deal with the economic crisis. So, you know the story. All these power individuals, the first set of pictures I showed you, have less power than their predecessors. Are these isolated cases and just anecdotes? I, is it, I am being very... Uh, tendentious in my selection of examples. Yes, I am. But I do have a ton of statistics and examples and evidence that shows that this is a trend. This is a global trend 
that is changing the world and that has gone until now largely unnoticed. Take, for example, this, this example. We have more countries. The number of countries in the world has quadrupled in that period. More countries, more presidents, more, more everything. We have more. Look at what's happening to dictators. In 1977, 89 countries were ruled by autocrats. Today, it's only 22. Today, more than half of the world population lives in democracies. And that includes China, meaning the world population includes China, which is not a democracy. <laughs> what I argue is that this trend about proliferation of players uh, and the dissemination of power and the decay of power is operational, and you can find it everywhere that humans are active. You can find it in politics and government. Landslides, victories are endangered species. They don't happen uh, that much anymore. Governments govern with very weak mandates. In fact, of the 34 nations of the rich club, uh, the rich country, um, club, uh, only four have a situation in which the head of state uh, and his party are, uh, also have the control of, of the legislative body of, of the Congress and the Parliament and so on. Um, and this is what I call the Gulliver effect, in which governments are tied down by a variety of factors, independent central banks, activist judges, local governments, financial markets, and NGOs, media, terrorists, global criminals, and many other actors are constraining governments. The same is happening with war. Just take a look at the first bullet. The weaker side wins more often. This is a fantastic, fascinating study by a scholar called Ivana Regin Tofts. He tracked and discovered that wars that broke out between 1800 and 1849, the weaker side, meaning the one that had less weapons and soldiers, won only 12% of the time. But look what happened later. The weaker side started winning more often. It is more probable now that the weaker side wins than the uh, stronger one does. And there is all that uh, other statistics, but somebody told me that I have four minutes to go, so I better move. This is business. Essentially, uh, this shows that it's very slippery at the top. If you are a top company today, uh, the likelihood that you may not be a top company soon is, has increased. The probability of that has increased. And there are a bunch of factors that, uh, uh, and, and st statistics that show that. And the same goes for CEOs. The probability that you are fired as a CEO is now much higher than what it used to be. Uh, and the same happens with labor, with philanthropy, uh, with, uh, with almost, as I said, almost every endeavor. Why is this happening? I argue that this is happening because the barriers that have historically shielded those in power are falling. What are these barriers? Well, they use, you, can, you know them. You're very large and you have a lot of um, land mass or a lot of resources or a lot of people in your country or you have money or you, like Syria, you have an army that is willing to protect you or you have technology or you have tradition and religion or you have charisma, you're a charismatic leader or you have property rights that give you exclusive access and control and monopoly or something or a brand name that is very alluring and enticing and people like Apple and so on. These barriers are all coming down. And they're coming down because they're becoming easier to overwhelm, easier to circumvent, and easier to undermine. And why? Why is that happening? Because of what I call the three revolutions. The more mobility and mentality revolution. The more revolution is that we have more of everything. We have more countries, but we have more people. We have more criminals and more armies. We have more computers and more medicines. We have measure, take anything you want and measure it. And you'll discover that today we have an abundance that has no precedent in the history of humanity. And we have so much of everything, including education, including health, including uh, uh, opportunities, that has consequences for power. It's, it's much easier to rule over 10 people than over 100 or 1,000 or 100 million or a billion. 
the mobility revolution is that the people not only uh, are more, but they move a lot. They communicate. And there is, and you know the story there, is the revolution, the technological revolution uh, in transportation, communication, and information, coupled with uh, political reforms that allow the movement of people, ideas, goods, money, everything is moving faster, cheaper, easier. So that's, it's, again, it's easier to control, dominate, and exercise power over a group of people that is confined within a perimeter that one uh, that moves all the time. And, and I'm sorry, and the other is the mentality revolution, which is a, ch a profound, profound change in values and attitudes, expectations, tolerance, and, and so on, uh, which is deeply documented. There's a lot of data that supports this. And so, the three revolutions the more revolution overwhelms the barriers that it used to protect the powerful. The mobility revolution circumvents them. And the mentality revolution undermines them. And that explains why the powerful are under threat and more constrained and more transient in their power. There is a lot to celebrate. There is a lot that is good about what I'm telling you. There is less uh, opportunity for tyrants and dictators and monopolies and all that. But there is also. Uh, be careful with what you wish for. It can be very dangerous if there is too much of what I'm describing. It is very dangerous when we get to a situation in which everyone has enough power to block others, but no one has enough power to impose any view, any project, any idea. And that then ends up in gridlock, inaction, slow or low quality of public decision making, institutional stagnation, anarchy. Failed states. The, a fa the essence of a failed state is the end of power. In a failed state, power is atomized in a way that is ungovernable. And that takes me to my inverted U curve. Essentially, if you measure here the decay of power, the fragmentation, dissemination, what I've just been describing, and in the vertical axis, you just measure what's good for society, what's, what, do we, what is desirable. In terms of political and social stability, economic uh, vitality, prosperity. So there is a part, and so here in the extreme right, in the extreme left, sorry for you, um, there is a lot of concentration. This is where tyrants live. This is where monopolies live. This is where a lot, there's a lot of concentration. And of course, it's better for society to move to the right. And so it increases the benefits. But there is a point where it, the benefits start to decline. And you enter a very dangerous zone of paralysis, inaction, and decay. What to do? Well, it's a long story, a complicated story that I'd love to discuss more. But I am convinced that we need a wave of political innovation.